Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort with Tim Westergren, uh, co-founder of Sessions. Uh, not his first rodeo. He also co-founded Pandora, uh, which which anybody who's paid attention to streaming music for uh, more than a minute knows about. Um, Tim, thanks for doing this. You bet, John. Good to see you again after a while. Yeah, good to see you. We had lunch, what, five years ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a different world than in so many ways. But I like to dive in in these interviews and just What's today's toughest problem that you're solving, uh, that you're working on? You got this new company, uh, Sessions, that uh, you are working on with the co-founder. Um, it's not Pandora. It's different. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's like the same old problem that people haven't solved, which is how musicians make money. And I know it sounds kind of mundane, but... The truth is, and you've been around with me through this the last 20, 25 years, like that problem has not been solved with all these, you know, yes, the industry's been ostensibly healthy, growing, stock prices are up and labels are doing better, et cetera. But, you know, aside from that very top sliver of musicians, it's kind of getting worse for everybody else. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think that musicians, uh, if they stay on the path they're currently on, it's not a very happy future. And there are, you know, sporadic cases of success and, you know, digital platforms lifting up musicians. But for the most part, you know, it's feast or famine. That's the thing I've been I've been wrestling with since I, you know, since almost 30 years ago when I first jumped into this whole thing. So that's the problem that Sessions is attacking head on. Let's talk about how Sessions is doing that. Um, it. it grew out of a very different kind of app that was really centered in gaming. And it's got yeah. some of those gamification features that um, I, I guess are intended to create engagement and incentivize a kind of interaction with the artist, the musician, and, and, and a sense of attachment. Uh, tell, tell me how, the, how that came to be. Yeah, so you're right that my co-founders, um, uh, Gordon Sue and Charles Drew Cousins, Ashley, come out of gaming. They'd spent about 10 years in that world when we met. And uh, they were interested in music. And uh, I was interested in solving this problem for musicians. And really what they had built uh, within gaming, as you mentioned, was kind of the, the cornerstone of the new product. And there are really two, two parts to it. One is what you just said is gamification. And, and, and gaming has spent you know, two decades refining essentially the art of creating virtual economies and enabling people uh, to make money off ephemeral things, goods and services that don't that aren't real. And an enormous economy exists now uh, in the world of gaming that's all about participation and validation and engagement. You're not actually buying anything physical for the most part. And so in a sense, like they started working on that two decades ago and you know leapfrogged over the music industry are now now a healthy growing sort of digital ready uh, industry. And so these guys have mastered the art of that. Um, that was one piece. And then the second piece is they built what we call a growth engine, which is essentially a very sophisticated uh, fan acquisition stack of technology that's plugged into hundreds of ad networks, all the big platforms. And it's kind of a core capability that lets them acquire users very efficiently. You put those two things two things together, and I think you have the ingredients for this solving this problem, which is mm -hmm. finding the audience, acquiring the audience, and when they get there, making money off them. And, and Sessions makes money on every show that it streams, and it markets them. It spends its own money to do it. So that, to me, it, it can could potentially create a very different future than the one we've you know, we've had so far. So usually I'll wait a little longer um, before taking questions, but. Uh, I, I see one here that's right along the lines of the model and what we're talking about right now. Um, and that's from Veronica. Uh, did Pandora and the other streaming technologies make it harder or easier for musicians to make money? And knowing a bit about the history of Pandora, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I guess you got to take early Pandora and late Pandora, right? And then talk about um, how streaming shifted over time. Yeah, so that's a great question. And there are, there are, the truth is there are two answers to it. One answer is Pandora as a radio product 
And I think as a radio product, it was accretive. You know, it it gave visibility. It gave promotion and it paid for non-on-demand streaming. So for a radio experience, which historically musicians had never been paid for. You know, so in broadcast radio, and that's still true today, the performers don't get paid when their songs are played on the radio, only the songwriters do. And we had changed that. So every hour that moved from broadcast radio to internet radio was found money for musicians. And I, I you know, for years I argued that the industry should be like wholesale supporting that transition because it was taking you know, it was, it was taking consumption from a platform and a medium that didn't pay artists to one that did. Lots of reasons that was a difficult uh, argument to make then. Then we became a subscription product, largely driven by the dynamics of direct deals and licensing and so on. We just couldn't per, sort of, we couldn't really control the business as a radio product. I think once we became a, a, a subscription product, then I think we became part of the problem, uh, which is, Really, you know, one price, one size fits all uh, consumption of infinite catalog. And I think that is not fundamentally a healthy business model for um, for musicians. Um, so that's kind of how I answer that question. Yeah, you know, I, I try to find lesser known artists um, and, and play their music. And it's, it's gotten to the point where you kind of have to, if you're going to listen to music on your phone, you kind of have to subscribe to a, a streaming service if you want to have any level of convenience. And what kills me about the business model is, even if I listen to just the Afro indie playlist on Spotify mm -hmm. all the time, all month, they're not going to get my monthly the, the whole of my monthly subscription fee. It's going to, you know, Taylor Swift is going to get it. Even if I didn't really listen to Taylor Swift. So it's like, even if you're finding as an artist, your, your audience on these streaming services, you're still not able to get the amount of, of money of revenue that kind of lines up with the level of interest that, 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 that fan is trying to show you. Yeah. You're, you're so right. I mean, th there are really, I think two, uh, central problems to subscription services right now. One is just the raw compensation, which is a combination of the actual money that's generated overall for the given the level of consumption um, and the way it's distributed, like you said, and that essentially uh, leaves most artists out in the cold. I mean, the second problem with it, though, is that artists are on those services kind of sort of commodity products. They're not, they don't really have a presence and they don't really own their audience. It's it's like they are, um, they're fuel to power a subscription product. And I think you if, you, if you look at kind of the nature of consumption on these platforms, musicians are kind of anonymous. You know, they're part of a playlist. There's a machinery around playlist creation and, you know, refreshing of content. Uh, and I think as time goes on, it feels to me like the consumer is moving further and further away from the artist. The artist is, is, is becoming more like wallpaper, you know, like a, just the sound that comes out of this playlist on your subscription product. So the artist doesn't, is not uh, connected and does not own their own audience. They're borrowing them from another service. I think those are two deeply problematic issues. And that follows through on so many services, no matter what kind of content you're talking about. Like if it's, if it's Facebook and you're building up a page for your business, um, you know, the audience really belongs to Facebook and eventually, right, they're charging you to talk to your own audience. It doesn't necessarily appear in people's feeds. And so at sessions, right, so for bringing this back to what you're working mm -hmm. on now, how do you change that up? To what degree can the audience actually, can the artist actually connect to the audience, own the audience, um, and even carry that off platform? Yes, I want to repeat what you just said because I think it's so it's so important, and I think COVID has maybe helped educate musicians about this in a way they hadn't been before. Which is, just because you have a million followers on Instagram doesn't mean you can reach them. You know, in, in a typical post, an organic post reaches about four to five percent of your audience, and like you said, if you want to reach more, you got to pay, and you got to pay a lot, and it gets more and more expensive the more of your audience you want to reach, and it's the nature of an ad business that is trying to extract as much money per ad as they can, that that money is spent really inefficiently. 
So what happened when the pandemic rolled around is a lot of musicians said, okay, dang, I can't go in physical space, but no problem. I got a big following on these social networks. I'm just going to market to them only to discover when they started doing that, like nobody was like, I, I post, but nobody comes. What happened? It's because it's not getting to them and they don't have, of course, a marketing budget to do it. So you're absolutely right. And that to me is an ex existential issue for the industry. It rents its audience event by event, show by show. And Sessions addresses this very directly and it's very connected to the growth engine. So when you when you're an artist and you play a show on Sessions and about three th almost 3000 artists are playing shows every week now all over the world. Um, when they play a show, we spend money to market it and we market it to their audience on their behalf. And we're able to get much greater reach because of our technology than they could by themselves. So we're actually solving that problem for them. And once their audience hears about them on sessions and joins them on sessions, they become theirs in perpetuity. So they can actually connect with them, market to them, communicate with them as much as they want on an ongoing basis. So the idea is like, give you control over your own audience and help grow it. I think I might've lost you, John. Yeah, sorry to glitch out for a second there. Uh, just had to switch to a more stable uh, connection. No problem. So, um, so we're talking about uh, how sessions is different from the older uh, streaming model. Now I want to kind of go back, way back, um, and, and talk a little bit about um, your path and, and where you came from. So uh, I like to start at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go Minnesota. Uh, yeah. where, where were you born? Uh, tell us about you know, household, family situation, siblings. Yeah, well, I, I was born in Minnesota. I was one of three kids growing up in rural Minnesota outside of Minneapolis. I moved overseas when I was six years old, though, and I grew up mostly in France and England. I came back to go to college in the U.S., so I really was an expat for most of my life. I, I wound up in California for college, and I've been in California ever since. So, you know, I graduated in the Bay Area and stuck around there and got caught up, caught up in the dot-com <laughs> Uh, boom, having spent like 10 years trying to make a living as a musician. So I'm a, when I graduated college, I started playing in rock bands and I was one of the sea of working musicians, you know, trying to make ends meet. So let's go though back to the, uh, to the beginning, beginning. Why'd you move from Minnesota? Was it a kind of a parent work situation or what? Yeah, my, my folks wanted to see other countries. So we got taken along for the ride. And my dad's Worked a lot in North Africa and the Middle East. I was always headquartered in Europe, so we, uh, we we traveled around quite a bit. So what was that like? Was that something that you enjoyed? Was it disorienting? Were you able to make friends and hold on to them? I think it kind of depended on where I was in my own maturation. <laughs> you know, I was when I became a teenager. You know, it was harder. It was harder to be kind of the the one with a funny accent. Um, you know, when you want to try to belong, but. I'll say that it's one of those experiences that I, in hindsight, I treasure and I'm really glad I did. Um, wasn't always, I mean, I, I, I was homesick. Uh, certainly, um, I, uh, you know, there was times when I wish, I wish that I had been back in the U S but, um, you know, ultimately I had a, I had a great experience and, and it was a, a very formative for me. Um, you know, I, I spent, most of my life essentially traveling around the world. You know, we, we were in Europe, but the thing you did when you're in Europe is you travel, you know, cause you're in the middle of everything. So we went everywhere. Um, where are you in the birth order? I'm in the middle of three. All right. So does that mean uh, conflict resolution as they tend to say with, with middle children or does yeah, it I mean like, you get to fly under the radar? I like to think, I like to think the first one's an experiment. The second one is you got it right. And the third one is a mistake. So, you know. <laughs> uh, were you, were you guys similar or have totally different interests and pursuits? You were all pretty different. Um, 
I got into music really. I, I played sports. Sports was a big thing for me growing up. But I also I got way deep into music when I was eight, nine years old or so. Um, I, Why? I I took to uh, piano, and I, I I connected with him. I was living near Paris, a, a jazz pianist, and I started learning blues piano when I was eight, nine years old, and um, I got hooked. And that was kind of you know outside of sports, my main hobby, and it just got more and more serious as time went on. How did that happen? How do you just sort of in France as an eight or nine year old get linked up with a, with a pianist? Gosh, it's serendipity. You know, I was a music teacher at the school and, um, uh, yeah, we, we befriended him and, and, uh, I was curious about the piano. And I think I, I learned the nice thing about learning blues is it's improvisational. So you don't really, it's not like you, you don't learn sight reading. You learn kind of structures and scales and kind of um, really, yeah, you learned how music is organized. And then within that, you just try stuff. You know, you improvise, you learn to improvise. The, 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 the first thing you learn in blues is a walking left hand. So like, it's like a bass line in your left hand and you learn uh, independence so you can play an accompaniment on your left hand, your right hand improvises and you learn scales, you learn how things fit together and nothing's written down. So it's just, you have to use your ear. And I think that develops your ear, but it, you also learn kind of because you're interested and in, you're playing what you want to play. Um, and I think that part of that's why I, my interest, you know, um, grew. I think if I'd been handed a bunch of Bach exercises when I was nine years old. I don't think I'd be still playing music now. It was the right thing for me at the right time. Is that where you stayed with that approach or, you know, did you learn to read music or was it really just about that improvisation and that discovery? I stuck in that for a long time. Uh, you know, after a while I stopped taking lessons and I was playing by myself and I, I, I wasn't, I'm still to this day, not a very good sight reader. Uh, I got serious about sort of the theory in college, actually. It wasn't until college. And then I took, um, right after college, I connected with a, 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 another jazz pianist. And I got really serious about it. And I started playing seven, eight hours a day. And I did that for a few years after school with the intent of really becoming a good pianist. Um, so there I got deep into it. Um, I burned out eventually on that. Like I learned that, you know, I wanted to be Oscar Peterson, but I learned that, you know, to, to become that good is, is borderline obsession and you have to, it's, it's like a certain personality almost. And I started getting interested in recording and, you know, songwriting was always a passion of mine and, and performing. And, and so pretty soon I, you know, I, I went into rock and I was in vans on the road and stuff. And, and so I, I kind of, kind of swerved into that that world um what was driving you at that time um i mean i am and you know i hesitate to even call myself an amateur musician but when i was in college that time period i wrote about 60 songs right mm -hmm. and I, I would walk around with a guitar all the time and a lot of it was what i call alchemy right turning lead into gold but turning pain turning emotion that's difficult to express into something beautiful. Like there was some stuff that I needed to work through. Sure. And that's why I was playing music at the time. And I've, I, I've never played music as much as I did then. What was mm -hmm. driving you during that period? Yeah, I think it's kind of the same thing. You know, I mean, I was overseas and, and being overseas, you have your family, but it's also very lonely. You know, you're, you are kind of, um, I mean, I moved to France. It, eventually I learned to speak French fluently. It didn't take super long, but you're still always kind of an outsider. And, and so you have a lot of, you know, you think about that a lot. You have a lot of time by yourself. Um, and uh, and I think that was a refuge for me, for sure. Um, and I do, I, I think it's true. A lot of the most talented musicians I know were running away from something. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, they were fueled by something. There's some truism to that. Um, and so for me, I think it was a companion um, and a place that was like, it was like, yeah, it was like my company um, was music. Um, and I think then after spending a lot of years working on it so much. And I started to develop some skill and some ability, then it became more rewarding as well. And, 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 uh, and then, you know, when I was, I guess around college is really when computers intersected with music and in the form of software recording. And all of a sudden, you know, with, 
it was still pretty expensive back then, but you know, you could with a hand with a keyboard and some decent software you had at your fingertips, you know, essentially a full orchestra and and just, you know, a, a huge range of instruments, like the world's instruments at your fingertips and the ability to multi-track. And like I just disappeared into that. You know, and I was <laughs> midway through college, like the last years of college, I barely saw the sunlight and I was living in the Bay area, you know, but I yeah. just I was in a studio. I just couldn't get enough. I mean, there's a lot going on at Stanford in the mid late eighties. Right. I mean, you know, you're a stone's throw from so much innovation. How conscious were you beyond the tools for music of the technological change that was going on. How interested were you in that versus, you know, the, the music that you were spending <laughs> all the time inside focused on and, and would then pursue after college? Well, I had awareness of tech in the context of music, of course, but pretty limited to that. Um, and I, I was, you know, I was kind of um, living an old fashioned existence, playing in clubs and, you know, it, tra driving around in a van, literally thousands of miles, to all sorts of places to play shows so i was living in kind of a retro world but in the late 90s you, if you were living in the bay area you couldn't help but experience and see and hear about all of this in, a, in entrepreneurship um and it was a time where i think if you had an idea um and and you were living there you thought about whether it's something you ought to go pursue because everybody was doing that all sorts of crazy ideas it was just a time when there was there was it's hard to remember it now, but there was a time when people didn't know what was going to happen with the web. Right. Mm -hmm. We had no idea. And the there was a notion that the potential was so infinite that you didn't want to miss out. And what that meant was people were willing to take all sorts of crazy bets on things because who knew, you know, what might turn into some giant part of the future. And so, you know, we had this, I mean, I had this idea, um, you know, the Music Genome Project that, that was, again, a totally a combination of all my past experiences. And, you know, that's an idea that would never have been funded, you know, anytime but right then. <laughs> you know? Well, it might be funded now if it had to do with crypto. Like you talk about the web <laughs> and what the web was like back then, where it's like, this could be everything. Exactly. That's what That's what the crypto folks uh, are, are thinking now. And, yeah. you know, that, that's why I don't tell them that they are crazy because it's like, that's Hey, right. I, re I remember moving to Silicon Valley at the very end of the nineties. And that's exactly what it was. And people thought folks like you were crazy, but, um, but you started stuff that continues to reverberate. So what was it then in the nineties that got you off the road and out of the van and turned you into a founder, right? That's, a, <laughs> that's a different <laughs> track than the one it sounds like you were on. Yeah, so there was, there was one step in between. So I, I did, eventually I just got tired of being on the road and being in a band is no picnic, you know. Certainly you have some euphoric moments, but it's a lot of hard work and it's, you're poor as a church mouse, you know. Um, and, but I, I love composing and I really got uncomfortable with computers. So I actually stopped, when I quit the band, I started film composing. I started making music for, for film and um, I love doing that. Uh, and um, I spent a few years at that commuting to Los Angeles. And um, that's actually really where the idea for the Genome Project was hatched, um, was as a film composer. Because I, 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 it's where I became so deliberate about trying to understand why someone likes a piece of music or how music works, uh, both because I was trying to convince a director to hire me and I, I wanted to understand what they wanted, but also because when you write a film score, you're trying to do something very intentional. You know, you're trying to make someone feel a certain way and you're trying to, you know, impact an image in a very certain way. So it's just much more kind of an instrumental form of composition. So it really, it, it yeah, it all grew out of that. And so what did, what did you do to begin to make that a reality? Well, it's funny, I, I had the idea, I'd read an article that sort of just, it was a moment where it triggered this idea. I, I was reading an article about an artist um, and all of these ideas that have been kind of s swirling in my head just like suddenly crystallized into this idea of creating a fingerprint for, for music. And 
Um, I shared it with my then girlfriend, now wife, who said, that's really interesting. You know, maybe you should talk to some more people about it. And then I shared it with a former college classmate of mine, an entrepreneur who actually already started and sold a company. So was, you know, had, had done it once. And he said, you know, this could be something substantial. Let's go see if we can get it funded, write a business plan. I was like, well, how do you do that? You know, um, and he showed me and literally maybe six weeks later, we had a million and a half dollars of venture funding based on just an idea, you know, and some very, very rudimentary projections. I mean, just nonsensical projections, but an idea, an idea really, you know. Speaking of soundtracks, there we go. We're on the journey. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what's the evolution then of it? Because the Music Genome Project is steps away from Pandora Radio, right? So um, how does the idea that wouldn't it be cool to have a fingerprint for music turn into something that's actually a, a product that people can consume? Yeah, so it started off as a recommendation engine. So we, we built this taxonomy and uh, hired a huge number of musicians to sit down and manually, you know, build this database that would allow us then to connect songs based on similarity. And it was it was remarkably effect powerful and it worked. It was pretty magical <laughs> um, building that thing. Uh, that, you know, the dot com thing all collapsed as we were doing it. So there were about four years when we were essentially just kind of fighting for survival, you know, um, and trying to license this, that technology, that recommendation engine to anybody we could. Um, and we were, you know, we were bankrupt. We weren't paying, we didn't pay salaries for two years, you know, maxed out. I maxed out 11 credit cards. It was a, it was a disaster. Um, and then we somehow after I, I did 348 venture pitches and finally in March of 2004, four years after we launched, we got our first real investment round, a bunch of money and uh, 348 venture pitches. Yeah, I counted them. <laughs> they were all on my calendar. I counted them. I didn't uh, know that, that were, there were that many VC firms in the valley. Yeah, like, I did them all. I did them all. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah. So we went, you know, we had kind of the the most extreme, one of the most extreme, you know, experiences of that time. Um, about 50 people work without Sally for two years. And um, and then, uh, but we hadn't built what? a business. Why didn't you give up? I think the real honest answer to that is, you know, I had taken a lot of money from friends, family, angel investors, and I'd convinced a lot of other employees to to take all this risk and sacrifice. And like, there was just no way I was going to leave. Um, I would be I would be going down with the ship. I'd be the last man off the ship. There was no choice, you know, to do but to do that. Um, and uh, I also, throughout that period, I never stopped believing in the capability like it was a, what we had built was really something i mean you you we had this little demo you type in a song and hit match and it would bring you back five songs and damn it they sounded a lot like that tune and half of them you'd never heard of before and it was really really cool i mean it was a true invention and uh and so i always thought man we just got to hang on just hang on we'll get there because eventually this is going to find a home and so uh yeah, I think those two things, this sort of sense of uh, obligation and, and loyalty to everyone, plus this belief that it was something that would be valuable, that was the combination for me and, and ultimately um, you know, got me to the other side. Uh, what was the moment of, of kind of peak this is working for Pandora during that time? Well, the funny thing about Pandora is, so, so we, in 2004, we raised that money and then we pivoted the business. So we took this, you know, recommendation technology we built and turned it into a consumer product. Um, we repurposed the genome into a playlist engine, which actually wasn't a big stretch from what it was already doing. And then we launched that in the fall of 2005 and it, it just exploded. I mean, I actually think the day I saw the demo of it, I thought, whoa, this is cool. People are going to like this, but then 
we, we, we had a demo of it, a beta, essentially. We handed it out to a couple hundred friends and family to just sort of test. And I think like a, a week later, there were 5,000 people on that demo. And those folks weren't supposed to be sharing it with anybody. So I, I think as soon as it, we were all like, oh my God, let's get this thing out there. And then when we launched it, you know, it just went, it just hockey sticked. Like, so now it's not like it was smooth sailing forever, but from a product standpoint, like I think we knew pretty right away that we had built something that had a, had, had market fit, let's say. Yeah. Now tell me about, uh, what is it? Uh, 2011 IPO. Yeah. So a lot in between there, but yeah, we went public in 2011 after, you know, um, experiencing that really incredible growth. Um, and that was a, you know, that was a cool moment. I mean, I still remember, you know, walking around the corner on wall street and seeing the giant Pandora sign covering the stock exchange, like the size of a football field. And that was a big moment for all of us. And because of what we've been through, you know, I didn't, I didn't take any of it for granted. I just, I, a day didn't go by that. I think like, I can't believe we're here because we should have been roadkill, you know, the odds of us getting to where we were, were so infinitesimally small, you know, there were times when I would wake up and think, okay, that was all just a dream. Now I'm going to wake back up and, you know, be back in my, my financial pit that I was in. But, but after an IPO, you're usually not in a financial pit. Right? Yeah, that, that helped. <laughs> so, so what, what was the difference there as an entrepreneur and as someone, you know, who has an appetite for risk, you're, you're in a different spot, right? Yeah. I mean, then it's like hardcore operations, you know, like once you do that, you're in the business of projections, hitting those projections, growing, scaling, answering to shareholders. And that is its own journey and it has its own appeal. Um, but it is not as entrepreneurial. I, I do think that companies, the real magical companies are ones that maintain their entrepreneurial um, identity through public. That's really, really hard to do, really hard to do. And I have enormous respect for companies that can do that. Um, but, you know, what happened, we, we went public. Some could argue too early, but the, the, the licensing situation for us was very difficult. And it meant that it was hard for us to, um, like, the, our, our economics were strained. And so it was easy to miss a quarter. And, you know, we missed a few quarters in a row. And... And then our stock, you know, uh, plummeted and, and then we got put in the penalty box and we got an activist in the stock a few years later. And so we kind of got into that not fun part of being a public company, you know, where you're underperforming and shareholders are not happy and someone's out to kind of, you know, grab the steering wheel. And so, you know, the last couple of years of that, of my tenure there at least were tough before, um, you know, Sirius came in to acquire us. Let's let's talk about that a little bit. I like to ask um, about a lowest point and what you got from it. Um, I call it Death Valley. Uh, <laughs> you know, a moment where you you thought this maybe isn't working. I need to completely change things up. Um, what would you say that was? Well, if you're talking about the Pandora, when, you know, from the time we were Pandora, doesn't but, have to be that, but whatever it, whatever it is for you um well there are quite a few of those moments um uh, i guess there is you know the um hmm, how do i answer that question um, certainly, you know, prior to Pandora, when we had gotten in that deep, deep hole, um, when we were at kind of our most strained and people had been, you know, without salary for a while and whatnot, um, that was the, that was the lowest point for me in every respect, um, mm. of the experience for sure. Um, it was scary. Um, and, uh, um, it felt like we were, it felt like we were kind of on this, um, 
on this climb to a mountain top that was so, uh, much further away than we thought. <laughs> and uh, or like it was a treadmill, you know, like it was a mountain that was rotating and just getting, just continuing. And, and it was torturous, you know, and, and the, probably the most uh, sort of psychologically difficult part of that is that you don't know if in the end you're going to fail. And so it's one thing, you know, when you're running a marathon and you know, at 26, whatever, 0.4 miles, you're going to be done. You get there, you know, but if you're running that fast, but you don't know how long the race is or if it actually doesn't really end, you know, yeah. that's different mentally. You know, um, that was the lowest point by far, the sort of last part of that before we raised that money. Um, is and- there a moment in all of that, a rejection or, you know, maybe even a quiet moment at home that you associate with that being the lowest point where you kind of hit whatever realization or, or rock bottom that is? I went to the hospital one night uh, near the end of that was where I was because I, 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 I had chest pains. Um, and I thought, you know, there was just stress. Um, so that, well, that was kind of like a substantial marker uh, of the moment. Um, but it's yeah, it's 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 a very it, it wears you down uh, over time, you know. Um, so that, I remember that like this isn't very good. I'm in a hospital here, you know. I was fine, but um, didn't feel fine. Right, right. No, that's that I would be memorable. And so, how did how did you come out of it, and what did you take from it? I. Um, I find oftentimes that there's a, a core belief uh, that people often bring from these Death Valley moments, whatever gets you through it, uh, becomes a tool in your toolbox. Um, did that happen for you? I think that for me, what happened was um, after getting through that and raising that money and then being able to kind of you know step back a perspective I began to develop beyond that was you have to not be focused on your goal. That's actually a, um, I think that's a mistake. Hmm. I think you have to focus on process. You have to focus on, this is what I'm doing right now. And I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to have the best attitude I can about it while I'm doing it. I think the, um, the act of pursuing a goal is actually what kills people or what, what's, what, what ultimately, um, it seems kind of um, strange to say that, but, um, you know, uh, there was a professor when I was at Stanford named John Stockdale, um, and he was a veteran of World War II, and he'd been in a prisoner of war camp, I think, in the Pacific. And um, he uh, uh, survived many years in one of these harsh prisons, and, and in a book he wrote about it, um, I think he called it Stockdale syndrome. Um, he taught, he asked, he was, he, he wrote about the difference between those who survived the camp and those who didn't not to equate what I went through with, um, with being in a prisoner of war camp. But what he said was the folks that, that, um, that didn't survive are ones who kept setting dates by which they'd get out. And those mm-hmm. dates would come and go and they eventually died of a broken heart. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, he just never set his mind on a date. He said, I'm here until I go out. I know I'm getting out eventually. I don't know when, but I'm not planning on a specific date. And the other thing I think that is, um, maybe this is kind of a Buddhist thing, you know, is you have to, you can't imbue your experience with something, some emotion, some negativity or some, you know, some value. It's just what you're doing. It is what it is. And you do it as best you can and uh you learn from it you and you enjoy it like you this is a learning experience and the truth is even if this whole thing had cratered and never turned into something what an amazing opportunity i had to have a startup and work with a bunch of really smart people and build a product that i loved and like try all these things and learn all these things like that's an incredible privilege and it's a hard perspective to have you in the middle of it but and it's easy to say it in hindsight, but that's kind of something I've thought about a lot ever since. How does that translate into what you're doing now at sessions, the way you approached it, 
and the the role that you're filling there. Yeah. So um, the the CEO and co-founder Gordon is a wonderful young man um, who has way more, way smarter and more sort of um, mature than I was at his age. Um, and I'm really trying to sort of just help him sort of teach him what I know. Um, and uh, so I think of myself as both a co-founder and operator, but also as an advisor. Um, mentors may be presumptuous, but um, I'm really trying to help him with perspective as much as anything too, as he goes through and the company goes through the various stages it goes through and, and keep, keep putting things in perspective as they happen. Um, Cause to me, that's, that's really valuable for entrepreneurs is to have perspective because it's very hard to have perspective when you're in the middle of running a company that's, that's, that's a, you know, startup like this. Um, and I also, of course, I, I bring to this 20 years of perspective on the music business, you know, so I really understand how this fits in and, and how what we're doing is connected to or not to different parts of the music industry. So I think it's, you know, perspective with a capital P is a big part of what I'm adding here. Mm. Now, as we continue to talk about sessions, I want to go back and get some of the questions uh, from the audience, one from Carlos about sessions specifically. Do you see this working for other forms of live performances such as stand-up? There's no question. No question. I mean, this, this platform has two basic capabilities, which is to bring a big audience and to gamify and monetize that experience for somebody who is creating something and sharing it with people. And I think it's going to branch out into all sorts of different directions. I mean, music is kind of our focus right now, um, but already musicians, you know, what is a musical performance is there's no sort of single answer to that. And musicians are already spending maybe 50, 60 percent of their time actually playing. The rest of the time, they're telling stories, they're talking, you know, there was a band that did a few shows and in their fourth show. They said, OK, we're not going to play. We're just going to cook and talk to you guys. And that's what they did. You know, so I think it's going to just evolve. Isn't that kind of like radio, though? Because, you know, there for as long as I can remember, there's been radio shows where, you know, an artist comes on, plays some music, tells some stories. I mean, you want to connect not just to the song, but to, you know, the, the individual artist or the band and get a sense of how they interact with each other. That's some of what I miss, frankly, in this era of streaming is like you were saying, it's just like a little tiny graphic and a name of something and a song. And it's like, I, I like the song, but there's not a lot more to hold on to, right? That's at the heart of this. I mean, this is a relationship you're developing, a two-way relationship, it's three-dimensional, and it's live, it's real. And I think there's not a lot of that in the world right now. Um, and I think you're right. That's a big part of why this succeeds. It's why artists are making money. And you know, artists are making real money here. You know, we're talking about, you know, there are a lot of artists on here that are making a living now playing on sessions that had never been paid to play before they started. And there are artists making anywhere from ten, fifteen thousand dollars to three hundred thousand dollars in a single show, a one hour show. Wow. Um, and like we had an artist play recently. She made ten thousand dollars in 45 minutes from 300 fans. And I can guarantee you that that artist, because I know what I know about her, wouldn't couldn't fill a coffee house in the real world. But on this platform, that solves this problem of location um, can kind of, you just add water and stir, like bam, you've got people in a room, you've got interaction, you've got monetization, and it turns into incredible patronage, which, you know, harking back to what we first started talking about, the efficiency of revenue of that compared to waiting for money from streaming, you know, it's just, in 45 minutes, she made enough money to put her in like the top 10,000 artists on streaming services. Probably, you know, it's it's uh, it's it, it's just such a better way for artists to relate to fans and earn a living. Does it scale? OK, but before I get to does it scale also, like when there are more artists and there are more people, does it still work? Uh, Jerome asks, are there early influencers uh, he says of your platform, but maybe he means on your platform this early in the process. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you mentioned that this person who made this artist who made all this money is not a big name. Um, what does this mean for reputation, for um, connection with audience? 
Do you think that as more artists get on the platform, that dynamic changes? Yeah. So the truth is musicians are influencers within their community, right? So an artist who starts to make money on this tells their friends. And we're seeing that it spreads very, very quickly across an artist community that's hungry for this kind of opportunity. Um, and we're in 250 countries in 18 languages. I mean, this is truly global. And the truth is that for 99% of musicians around the world, there is literally no platform where they can be seen. Yes, there are tools and there are networks where you can be present, but that's different than being heard, right? Just because you're on Facebook Live doesn't mean anybody's there. This is a platform where you actually have people there and, and making money. So, um, uh, Well, how, how is that different though? How can you guarantee, uh, is it because you kind of curate and limit the number of musicians who are on the platform that you can sort of guarantee some level of audience? Well, we do curate, but the reason we can do it is because of this growth engine I spoke about earlier that we can, we're super good at acquiring users. Now, not everybody succeeds, of course, right? So you can play, but if you can't deliver a compelling performance or you, you don't have an ability to relate to your fans, you won't thrive. But what this is doing is giving folks who have those capabilities the chance to really realize their full potential. Um, and we're seeing it. Um, so it really is up to the artist. Hmm. Um, producer for uh, Tech Check asks, what's the best way to monetize audio conversations? <laughs> well, that's not my bailiwick. I mean, I would, <laughs> I would, I would say the first thing is make them video, probably. Um, uh, that's how I don't, you know, that's, a, that's different. It's just a different, it's a different domain. Um, but I, I think the cornerstone of what works on sessions is the connection, right? The, the, this, the, the fact that there is a two-way street, um, there's acknowledgement, there's validation, there's belonging. Um, it's not just like a transaction. It's not a tip. A tip is like a, is something you do to, to sort of, you do once it's charity and it's like to, to relieve your conscience. This is something much more deep than that and enduring. Hmm. I want to go back to uh, you were talking about Pandora and um, and some of those difficult times early on. Veronica asked, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs or people who are doing things um, that need support, mm -hmm. you know, projects, whether they're uh, startup efforts or not would want to know, how did you initially convince investors it was a worthwhile investment, even though you didn't have a vision for a consumer product? And I guess that's going back to the genome mm -hmm. project before you had Pandora. Well, the truth is I didn't for a long time. <laughs> I mean, you know, I failed 347 times. I think what you had some money, you got a million and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the dot com. You got to kind of like, that's the dot com. That's different. But I think the, the the investment happened eventually for two reasons. One is because this idea was cool, and like you could see it in action, and you could, if you had some vision, you could recognize it had potential. And the second thing was we just wouldn't go away. So you know, if you're an investor, you like tenacity. You invest in people that don't give up. And I really think that was a big part of it. They said, Jesus, like these guys are like a cockroach. You know, if <laughs> if they if they can last through this, they're going to figure it out. You know they're going to die trying. And that's who I want to invest in. I think that was a big part of it, frankly. Hmm. And so now when you see what um, the web has become, when you see what's happened to the music industry and the continuing struggle for the middle class of artists to make a living, how long do you think it'll take for this to play out? Um, you know, there's, there's an article about, sessions where you know someone is recalling that that you said it's not right that a 20 something talented artist can make more money as an uber driver so you know can, can we fix this are you at the point yet where it's clear that it's fixable how long do you think it'll take to answer that question yeah i think i think i think sessions is going to fix it that sounds pretty grandiose but it, uh it took somebody coming in from the gaming side with these capabilities to, I think, put the right pieces together. But I think there's nothing about what we're doing that can't scale enormously. And we won't be the last that does this eventually, but 
uh, that I think combines these various pieces, which is, is three, I guess a three-legged stool. It's audience acquisition, this growth engine I spoke about. It's gamification and kind of the monetization that comes with it, like the, that, that, that ability. And the third is a rich interactive medium. So, you know, um, I don't think this works for any kind of um, creative work. I think the, this human rich three-dimensional video, audio, full immersive kind of experience is part of, is, is a big part of that. So, you know, a live performance is a musician's most valuable asset, much more than a digital file, you know, or some, uh, uh, the, the, uh, a recording. And I think it's in a live performance that an artist can be most compensated, right? Their most, can be most valued. I mean, you know, buskers on the corner of a street make a lot more money than people make on streaming services. You know, that's the truth because even with 30 people or 40 or 50 people watching them because there's a much deeper connection and people feel that they connect to the person they put when they put the ten dollars in the guitar case the musician nods and looks at them and says thank you you know and by the way that busker is there every thursday and friday and that person walks to and from work every day and like they put a buck or two every time like that's what we're talking about building but without the constraints of being on one corner at a time Hmm. Uh, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask what this artist has asked on LinkedIn. I'm sure a lot of people want to know in terms of the, the scale uh, calendar and timeline of the platform. Uh, Jackie asked, how do I get my vocal music on sessions? I'm an independent contractor wanting to reach a wider audience with my jazz and pop CDs. Well, you can apply. There's a way to apply online. Just go to the website. There's a way to do it. Or you can send your uh, contact information to to uh, John Fort and he'll forward it to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Use uh, you can use LinkedIn. Your connections. <laughs> you can use LinkedIn to do that, uh, and I'll make sure it gets to Tim. Um, well, uh, this has been great, um, and I and I want to um, kind of bring it all back home in the sense that Pandora is connected to sessions. It feels like there's unfinished business, yeah. right? I mean, there was something that you intended to do with Pandora and whether it's timing, whether it's, you know, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or the, the buffeting pressures of industry competition, they didn't allow you to get there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, it's like you're inside my head. Yeah. 100%. Like to me, this isn't about me and my professional ambitions, you know, but Everything that I did at Pandora is has a bearing on sessions, and I have this I have this I feel incredibly lucky now to have met two folks who come from a completely different perspective and bring all of their learnings of 10, 12 years developing gaming products, um, and I think that combination is going to solve a giant problem that has been around my entire adult life from the from the day I was you know went out putting flyers on telephone poles to pull people into shows at small clubs. So I think, I really think that these things put together will will harness the web for artists in a way it's never been harnessed before. And, you know, I feel as energized now as I did, gosh, 20 some years ago when I, when I founded Pandora and I see a lot of the same signs and sessions that I saw when Pandora started to inflect. I just, I can sense things coming our way, things it, it's, it, it's, it's like when you build the right product, all the things that were obstacles and hurdles, suddenly like well, they have all gone. And now things are really, the wind is behind you. And I feel that. Uh, and I think it's because um, we, we are, th this is a business that is actually truly win-win. And people usually say win-win, it's bullshit. You know, it's not really win-win. This is really win-win. I mean, uh, our business model is based on taking a commission from the money artists make. That's all we get paid. We, we, we spend our own money to market things. For an artist, it's an opportunity that they didn't have before. And technology allows this to scale. So there's no natural impediment to this. There's no adversary to this. You know, and, and I think once you do that, things start to sort of work is what I see happening. And that's what happened when Pandora launched. Everything just started to work. Um, and that's a really magical feeling. So it's good to have it again. 
Tim Westergren, uh, great to talk to you on Fort Knox. It's been too long since we had lunch. Uh, yeah. I think it was a Japanese place in, in San Francisco five Good years morning. ago. Good yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're getting back to the point where we can start to do things like that again. Right. So I look forward to it. Likewise. All righty. Thanks, John. Take care.